market update for every meeting that we do, but every August and every February, we do a very deep dive market update, and that's actually the keynote presentation. Uh, so that's what you guys are in for tonight. I'm excited to go through this uh, because for me, I, what, what I've found is in real estate investing, we're always in some part of the market cycle. So we need to understand where we are in order to invest properly. And some of you guys heard me say earlier today my favorite Wayne Gretzky quote, which is, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going. And never is that more true than for us as real estate investors when in many cases we're holding our properties for at least six months for our short-term fix and flips and maybe five, 10, or 15 years for some of our longer-term buys and holds. Uh, so this will kind of give you an idea of where the market's going. Much of this information I pulled from the Texas A&M Real Estate Center. Uh, Dr. James P. Gaines did a presentation to the Austin Board of Realtors last Wednesday. Uh, Texas A&M Real Estate Center is a great source for all of the data that you need to evaluate where we are in the market. And uh, they do fantastic presentations. So you'll see a lot of slides that are uh, taken directly from their presentation. You'll also see slides in here from the Dallas Federal Reserve. So uh, they do a forecast every month on the Austin market specifically. Uh, you'll also see some notes from uh, the Austin Chamber of Commerce, as well as CBRE, uh, the world's largest commercial uh, real estate investing firm as well. So I pulled it from several different spots to kind of come up with what the forecast will be over the next uh, 12 months and beyond. Uh, to put it simply, uh, 2018 was a fantastic year for us here in Central Texas. 2019 is going to be a great year for us here in Central Texas, but we are seeing the growth moderated. We're not seeing as much growth as what we've seen in prior years, but it is still great growth. Uh, our GDP uh, in the state of Texas uh, was 3.2% uh, uh, in 2018 versus 2.9% for the United States. Personal income growth uh, grew for us at a higher rate than it grew for us nationally, 5.3% versus 4.5%. Oil prices, which I know we're not in Houston, but we are affected by what's going on in the oil and gas market uh, in Houston. And it's been holding steady in the $40 to $60 per barrel range, uh, which is not enough for them to be uh, popping champagne, but it is enough to keep them from uh, firing a lot of people like what they did in 2016, as an example. Uh, our jobs are expected to increase this year by about 2%. It's not as much as what they had increased at in prior years, but still very good. Our population is incredibly strong here in the Austin market. In fact, um, I'd kind of like to close, if there's, a, if there's a wall that I want to build, it would be around the city of Austin. Uh, but uh, we have people moving here like crazy because we have incredible job growth. Um, our exports are still very strong, but there's a lot of trade regulation talk right now. Uh, from both the presidential level as well as in our Congress. Uh, that's going to affect what our future looks like economically, too. Some of the big drivers that we have that have uh, done really well for us here again, uh, we have the jobs. Uh, the jobs that we have here in Austin are of a higher e income than what they are throughout the rest of the Texas. I'll show you what that looks like compared to Texas in the next couple of slides. Uh, again, we have a ton of people uh, moving here. Uh, capital and money markets are still very strong. Uh, you saw two people uh, that came up that are our lenders that would love to make loans to you and find ways to fund your projects. Uh, as long as that money is flowing, right, there's a great opportunity to invest in real estate. Uh, government, uh, uh, there's a lot to be said here, but I'm not going to go uh, very political. Uh, but we, this is something that we are watching. I was uh, relating a story to an investor friend of mine that uh, I recently had one of my properties painted. And uh, the first couple of days, we had about 12 to 15 guys there coming in to paint. And then Trump made an announcement saying there's going to be an immigration raid. And guess an immigration raid. Do you guys remember that? About a month ago, right? Uh, and guess how many people showed up to paint, continue painting the property after that was announced? Uh, instead of having 12 to 15 people there, I had about three to four people there. 
Uh, so some of these things do affect us even here in Austin, so something to be aware of. And I'm not checking immigration status. Uh, I'm just looking for, for, for people with paintbrushes, right? Uh, just because finding great uh, contractors is really hard to do. But some of the things that go on in the government do affect us. Uh, technology and the growth and the speed at which we are gaining in technology is affecting us. Uh, for us as real estate investors, we're seeing competition from places like Open Door. For realtors, realtors are seeing competition from Zillow uh, and some of the other companies that are some of the lower or discount brokerages, and that's all being abled, enabled by technology. Uh, consumer confidence is one of our big market drivers and whether or not people think we're about to go into a recession. So we'll talk about all of those things as we go through uh, this presentation. So since 1950, we have seen 11 different uh, long series of economic expansions. I've listed which uh, all of those economic expansions here, but right now, as of June of 2019, we passed the 121-month mark of being in the current economic expansion that we are in right now, which is both very exciting as well as very terrifying, right? Uh, so what does that make some people think? Uh, so there's the glass half full, like, yes, let's keep this thing going. There's a the glass half empty, which is, man, when's the, when's the shoe going to drop? When's the economy going to slow down? And how is that going to affect me? Which a lot of people are concerned about that. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the data that backs that up uh, shortly. But we did set a new record at 121 months uh, this past June. Uh, and you can see consumer confidence, and this is the Texas consumer confidence, is still very strong. So this chart goes back to January of 2007. So you can see that was a very uh, good time for us as we were getting 80% and 20% loans. Uh, everyone was able to get a loan, and then the market crashed, uh, and consumer confidence dropped into the 40s, uh, and we were starting to make our way out of it. Uh, here in the Austin market, we really started to come out of the recessionary period in roughly January of um, uh, uh, January and through the summer of 2010, and you can see where the consumer confidence has been for us here in Texas ever since then. Uh, the big drop that you see in 2015 through 2017. That was a, a big uh, 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 reason why we saw that is because oil and gas was trading at about $110 a barrel in 2014 and started trading in the mid-30s a barrel in uh, 2015. So that did have an effect on our consumer confidence um, as those prices started to go down, as those oil company profits started to go down. As it stabilized more in 2017 and 2018, uh, specifically in that $50 to $60 range, companies stopped firing and started hiring, but they were not hiring still at the rate that they were, for example, in 2014. Uh, 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 but it's still, uh, still very strong and even at a higher level than it was, for example, in January of 2007. Some of the leading economic index or some of our indicators, you can see some of the prior market cycles that we've had. Uh, specifically here in Austin, we were very much hurt by the tech bubble uh, that we had, for example, in the January of 2000 range. So you can see our leading economic indicators going into it were very strong. And then as the tech bubble started to crash, it went down and it started to come back up as a result of easy credit. And then it went down in the Great Recession. It's been up again. And then we had the oil bust, which brought it back down. And then we stabilized oil prices, which brought it to where it is today. And we did have a small decrease um, at the towards the end of last year, and that was primarily um, an increase in interest rates as well as a dip uh, for a period of time in our oil prices as well. Uh, speaking of oil, uh, oil production, uh, now Texas is, uh, I think, one of the largest uh, produ producers of oil in the entire world. Uh, part of that is because of the fracking that we started to do uh, uh, several years ago. So you can see the amount of oil production uh, that we've had has gone up su substantially. It went back down again when we saw the price per barrel go down. So you can see those things correlate 
But as the price per barrel started to go back up, we started to uh, produce more oil again as well. So this is something that affects us here in the Austin market, even though most of the companies are in Houston. A lot of those people that are in Houston are coming here to buy second homes or are coming here to buy properties for their children who are going to school here. Uh, so that does have an, uh, have an economic effect on us as well. Uh, the job growth here in Texas, uh, this chart goes back to 1990. So in 1990, we had about 7.1 million jobs uh, versus today we are forecasted by the end of 2019 to have about 12.8 million jobs. Uh, so we've seen a huge increase over the last several years. Uh, we've been in this kind of uh, one to uh, two and a half percent band in terms of job increases. And it's predicted that for 2019, we're going to see about a 2% increase in the number of jobs that we create as well, which is positive, which, and we we're already seeing uh, good job creation so far. We're not hitting uh, specifically in Austin that 2%, uh, but I'll show you those numbers as we go through the next couple of slides. Population change, it's, in, it's coming, it's here in Austin. We've known that for a very long time, but it's not just the population growth that we're seeing here in Austin. We're also seeing it in San Antonio and Houston and in the Dallas and Fort Worth markets. Of the 254 counties in Texas, between 2010 and 2017, 91 of those counties did see a population decrease, but they were more in areas where there's not much going on except for the family farm, and the only reason to stay there is to continue to run the family farm. Uh, other than that, there's not a whole lot of economic development that might make some uh, folks stay there. Uh, so that's why we saw some decreases in some of those markets. But you can see that 67% uh, of our population is in what we call this urban triangle, right? The Houston, San Antonio, uh, Dallas, and Austin markets. And 87% of our population here is in, in Texas is just east of this I-35 line right here. So it's all uh, coming this way. And the forecast over about the next uh, 30 years is that we're going to have up to 90% population growth or 90% of our population, if you will, will be based in this urban triangle. So even more people are going to be moving here. So you know that cute little um, HOV lane that they put on Mopac? That would have been fantastic like 25 years ago. Uh, but now the faster that they start the project to double deck Mopac, uh, the faster we'll be prepared for what's really happening in terms of growth in this market specifically. And same in uh, uh, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, infrastructure is going to become a bigger and bigger deal because people are moving here at a faster rate than we can build for them to move. Uh, this is the historical look back of the sales that we've had. Uh, so the sales are listed here in green and average price in blue, medium price in red here. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, the forecast for 2019 for all of Texas is predicted to have some growth, uh, not a whole lot of growth, but some growth. Uh, and the number is positive. You can see that in our top month in 2006, in the last economic cycle, we sold over 300,000 houses. We did not get to that same level until 10 years later, 2006. We had a big volume bubble in this time frame uh, that it took us a while to uh, get, get past. But for our sales price bubble, we were back on in terms of our sales price in less than two years, and we have been at about the same rate that we would have been had we not had this little drop right here. However, the, the, uh, this curve is a little bit steeper uh, than this was in here, and I think right now we are definitely seeing a pricing bubble in Austin as well as throughout Texas, and that pricing bubble has been... Um, allowed has been, um, oh gosh, um, uh, it's, it's been enabled, if you will, by these low interest rates that we've had over the last several years, right, that have made houses significantly more affordable. Uh, that's what's allowed that price to continue to grow um, at a very high level and especially at a high level versus the median household income, which we'll look at that in the next couple of slides. 
Uh, but if we do hit a market cycle dip and a recession, uh, we probably won't see a, re a reduction in the number of housing sales because the housing sales that we have now are uh, the foundation of those sales, uh, the, the growth in population, the growth in jobs is all really strong. But if interest rates start to go up, it may be harder for us to sell those houses at the rate that we were selling them at before and at the price we were selling them at before. Uh, so that's something that we're watching uh, very closely as we do our forecast as well. Uh, this chart just looks specifically at the median home prices going back to 1990. The big takeaway here is that from 2012 to 2018, there was a 49% increase in the median home price. And again, you can see uh, that it is a much steeper curve from 2012 to 2019 than, for example, it was in any prior cycle before. Uh, so that is something that, again, has been enabled by low interest rates, more people moving here um, who can afford uh, higher priced houses, um, and of course the fact that we have great jobs that are paying us more here than in uh, other uh, places specifically uh, in, in the country. Uh, so this graph scares me a little bit, uh, but this is sort of the new normal, or at least it has become the new normal. And again, part of this is a function of, and it doesn't show what that looks like uh, in terms of affordability, but part of this is a function of the low interest rates that we've had over the last several years. So I'll boil this chart down. So it's everything's indexed back to 1989. So for example, in 1989, the median price uh, was a function of the household income and the way that we would got to the median price in 1989 was we took the median household income and we multiplied it times a factor of 2.65. In 2017, median price as a function of household income is 3.6 times that household income. So basically more of our household income is going towards our housing expense. The reason why that float can be allowed is because, for example, in 2006, interest rates were about 7%, right? Today, what are interest rates right now? In the threes, in the fours, right? Can you afford to pay a little bit more, buy a little bit more house when interest rates are that low? And the answer is yes, because what are you looking at? You're looking at your monthly payment. Um, so yes, interest rates will have a big effect on uh, uh, the housing market and what we can afford as, uh, as, as, as homeowners and, and as real estate investors, what we choose to uh, move our assets into. So adjusted household income has been pretty flat, really has only gone up about 20%. 20%, but median household price has not been flat at all and has gone up at a rate of about 226%. Uh, so those are the big things that kind of cause us to uh, have a little pause and to be especially uh, concerned about what they do from a legislative uh, level, uh, from a federal level with those interest rates. Uh, the business cycle index, so this looks at several different factors uh, in terms of where we are in the, in the index, and I'm actually going to break down Austin specifically in the next couple of slides. Uh, but for us, it'll break out what the growth uh, rate is, and I think, I, I think I'm just going to wait to get to that slide. It's going to give you a better idea. But you can tell um, from this chart, what I, what I do want you to take away from this is that Dallas has been on a little bit bigger of a tear uh, or, or a little bit bigger results uh, than some of the other markets that are listed here. And again, in the next couple of slides, I'm going to break out the Austin one specifically. Uh, months of inventory, so this is something that we've been watching for a long time. Uh, our balance market is usually somewhere between six and six and a half months of inventory. Here in Austin, we're somewhere between two and two and a half months of inventory. And that means it's a seller's market. So they say anything less than six months, a seller's market. And when you're in a seller's market, what do you see with the prices? You see the prices start to go up because you see many properties that are listed. They have multiple offers above list price, in some cases on the same day that the property is listed for sale. So that's one of the big things that we see. And we see those prices. Uh, another thing that has pushed those prices up, in addition to the interest rates, has been the fact that we have very little inventory in this market. 
I've been waiting for the builders to start building, uh, but as I'll show you in the next couple of slides, uh, their building rate is still not keeping up with the absorption rate of the number of uh, sales that we've had here specifically in this market. Uh, looking at the building permits specifically, so again, you can see we were building more houses in the last market cycle than we are building today. What's interesting about this is in the last market cycle, uh, specifically here in Austin, we were selling less than 20,000 units a year. Today, we're selling over 35,000 units a year. So we're just not keeping up, and that's what's keeping the inventory down, and that's what's also building those prices uh, back up as well. Multifamily permits, uh, something kind of very similar. We are building more multifamily. Uh, we, we surpassed the number of multifamily permits than what we built in the last market cycle, but right now we're building about the same amount of multifamily as we built in the last market cycle. But again, we have more people coming here and we have that population growing. Uh, so still not building as much as what we would like to see or as much as we actually need. Uh, the forecast, uh, this breaks down all of the different markets, all the different large markets. So specifically for housing permits in Austin, uh, 2018 versus 2017 was up 9.6%. The 2019 estimate is, is that it's only going to be up 0.2%. So we're still not responding in terms of building permits here. Uh, the number of sales up 2.3% in 2018 versus uh, up 2.8% in 2019. So we're going to have more sales on fewer properties for sale, which that math doesn't work out unless you realize that it works out in, by way of increase in prices. Uh, price per square foot up 4.5% versus 20, 2018 versus 2017. It's scheduled to be up 4% 2019 versus 2018. So we'll see an increase in price uh, but we won't see the same um, as high a percent as what we saw in 2018. Uh, one thing I do want you guys to take away here, too, is that the Dallas-Fort Worth market, which is uh, always listed as the bellwether for the rest of Texas and especially Austin and San Antonio, had a down year, year over year, 2018 versus 2017, for the first time since 2010. Okay, they say as Dallas goes, so does the rest of the market. So that is something that we are watching too. So far year to date, Dallas sales are down about 4 to 5% uh, through the year to date through June. So, uh, but, but the Austin sales and San Antonio sales are still incredibly strong. In fact, uh, 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 yeah, both, are doing, both of those markets are doing really well. Uh, the key takeaway from here, uh, is this is kind of a summary of the last slide as well, is to take a look at the months of inventory. You can see Austin has the lowest months of inventory of any of the other markets. Uh, you can see that uh, Austin has good sales, but nothing extraordinary versus what we, where we've been. Uh, still much stronger than uh, Dallas. Uh, Houston, Houston cannot be stopped. I don't care if there's a hurricane that buries like half of that city. Uh, it's just, it's not stopping. The 2017 sales were bigger or higher than the 2016. The 2018 sales higher than the 2017. And 2019 sales year to date are higher than the 2018 sales. So a very strong market. Uh, and what I'll say about Houston is, and I talked a lot earlier about oil and gas and the price going from $110 a barrel to $36 a barrel at its, at its bottom. When that happened, and, and I do some investing in Houston um, as well, I thought the bottom was going to fall out of the Houston market just because of what happened, for example, in the 1980s and what's happened in prior market cycles when you look at the effects of oil and gas and the price per barrel uh, specifically on, on Texas. But what's happened through every single economic downturn as, that was as, uh, caused by a result of oil and gas in Houston, Houston has gotten more and more and more and more and more diversified in terms of their economic uh, pool of employers and types of employers, right? My guess is that probably at least half of you in here have gone to an, an MD Anderson 
uh, or some cancer treatment for a, a relative in Houston where they are single-handedly, hopefully, about to cure cancer. Uh, so they have gotten more and more into healthcare, and and a lot of the a lot of the jobs, uh, specifically the management type jobs, they can flow very fluidly back and forth between healthcare and oil and gas. So that has helped absorb a lot of the uh, downward uh, or uh, the reduction in force that oil and gas has seen was picked up in healthcare. And that market has very low unemployment rate too. And I think I've got a slide for that uh, coming up. Some of the things that we're watching here in the Austin market and really just throughout Texas is, again, that limited inventory availability. We also have a very, it's not just, don't just think of this in terms of limited housing availability, but also think of it as limited lot availability for builders to build some of those new houses. Uh, affordability is always an issue here. I was talking to a friend of mine who's been a broker here in Austin for about the last 35 years. And I'm like, how long have they been saying that Austin's not affordable? And he's like, yeah, ever since I got my broker's license 35 years ago. Uh, yes, it is more expensive here in Austin than it is in the other major markets. Uh, but that's always been the case. But we also have a higher income in this market than the other uh, three major markets that we compare to. Something to be uh, cognizant of and to be worried about, especially as a real estate investor, is those increasing interest rates, right? So if now interest rates go up uh, 1%, and I was just talking to a colleague and she, she gave me the quote, she said, as interest rates go up 1%, your, what you can afford to buy in terms of a house goes down 11%. So for example, if you were going to be able to buy a $330,000 house when interest rates were 3.5%, now you can only afford a $300,000 house if interest rates go from 3.5% to 4.5%. That really has an impact on the buying power and will also have an impact on us as we're selling the properties that we buy, fix and flip out in the marketplace. So something to be sensitive of. And, you, and, and, and a $30,000 swing, for example, in a price, and I'm not saying that's what would happen, but a $30,000 swing in a price could represent, I don't know, maybe half or all of your profits as a real estate investor. Uh, so again, that's why uh, that's something we're watching very closely. Uh, concerns about uh, the general uh, economy. Um, uh, so that's going to be uh, uh, an issue. Uh, I think a lot of people are worried that there's going to be a recession. Uh, once you get to 121 months of economic expansion, and it's the longest expansion since 1950, yeah, no, everyone's a little worried that something's about to happen. So there are some fears about that. There's also a lot of negative press about uh, uh, the, the, the idea that the recession is coming. Uh, we also have seen and we always see a fair amount of stock market volatility. I will say if some of you guys are considering, hmm, stock market or real estate, if you look at the volatility in the stock market, the volatility in the stock market looks like this, right? High highs, low lows. The volatility in the real estate market is much more uh, uh, the, the band is much smaller. So it's more looks like this, right? As the stock market is going like this, the real estate, can you, this, this is a visual, I'm sorry. Is that, is it, and it's like, okay, I'm going to chew gum and walk at the next, at the next, uh, at the next presentation. Uh, but uh, it, the band is a lot tighter, for example, especially here in Texas. If we were in California, I would be saying something completely different. But here in Texas, that band is very tight around that price volatility. And you saw it as I put up many of the slides going back to, in some cases, the early 90s to see what that looks like. So uh, it, it still is a much better bet to be in the real estate market than it is, in my opinion, than in the stock market, especially if this is a market that you study very closely. Uh, so they do say that the probability of a recession is relatively high right now. Uh, and it's not as high as what it was in the last market cycle when you can see the probability of recession got to uh, about 40%. And then right after that, we hit that recession, right? So uh, right now we are at about 30%. And a big part of 
the, the things that they're looking for, uh, and it's listed here, it says the model uses the differences between the 10-year and the three-month treasury rates. So normally, <clears throat> um, those rates are kind of aligned with each other. Uh, lately, those rates and the yield curve have been inverted, okay? So usually when you see that inversion in that yield curve, that's when they see a higher uh, probability of a recession. Uh, now, how will a recession affect us here in Austin? Uh, again, I think it will be v banded very tight uh, just because of the amount of people that move here, uh, specifically when there is a recession, because we still have the jobs here in Austin. Uh, speaking of the jobs here in Austin and speaking of where we are in the Austin business cycle, uh, so this uh, shows that uh, uh, our growth period, um, which is about 6%, is our long-term growth average. And this chart goes back to 2007. So since 2010, which is roughly about the time that we came out of the recession here in Austin, it's been above that long-term rate of 6%. Um, and it got really high. And again, Austin is affected by oil and gas came down in about the same time period that the oil and gas prices went down in Houston, uh, went back up as oil and gas stabilized, still not as strong as it was before, uh, but right now it's at 8.1%, which is actually uh, <laughs> really high. Uh, so it's the strongest expansion since November of 2015. Uh, the recent strength in the index was propelled by historically low unemployment rates, Robust job growth, uh, suggesting healthy performance in the Austin metro area. I'll show you guys the uh, unemployment rates for here specifically. Uh, they're some of the lowest in the state and some of the lowest in the country specifically. Uh, so this chart shows the United States on the black line, Texas on the red line, and Austin on the green line. Uh, so Austin right now has a 2.6% unemployment rate. Uh, they say the government says full uh, employment is an unemployment rate of less than six and a half percent. So we're running at about half of what the government would call full employment. Uh, and the interesting, another interesting ch chart, I didn't in, uh, include it, but uh, they showed uh, the, the curve, if you will, or the chart for the number of people that are saying, hey, I'm looking to hire. And basically, for the city of Austin, there are more people, there are more job wanted. I'm sorry, uh, 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 not, not uh, uh, yeah, job wanted. Job wanted? Uh, the number of people who need employees was actually higher than the number of people that are even available to take those jobs. You never hear that. You never hear that. Normally, there are more people who want jobs than the number of jobs that are available. Here in Austin, it's the exact opposite. It's, it's just barely inverted, but it is inverted. So uh, we have such uh, great uh, employment here. And for a long time, uh, I've m met and talked to a lot of people who came here, and I asked them, well, when you, came, when you moved here, did you have a job? And the number of people who say, no, but I knew I could get one, is extraordinarily high here in Austin. So we just need more of those people to come to fill all the jobs that we've got. Uh, the U.S. unemployment rate is also at its lowest point at 3.7% uh, since they began to measure unemployment back in 1976. Uh, and how can we afford a higher price home here in Austin versus uh, uh, the other uh, parts of Texas versus the other parts of the United States? Well, it's because we make more here in Austin. So in Austin, our average rate is about uh, just under $29. It had gotten uh, uh, just over $29, and we'll talk about what may have drugged that down. But in the United States, it's uh, just under 28 and in Texas overall, it's uh, just over 26 So yes, it is more expensive here, but the jobs here actually pay more, so there is a more ability to afford uh, those rates. So you can see this little bump down right here. So from the uh, Dallas Federal Reserve report, they said part of the recent drop in the Austin Metro's average rate wage may be due to comp uh, compositional effects where the rapidly growing construction and mining sector dragged down the average. So 
Um, basically, we had some people enter the marketplace that had a lower than average uh, job here in the Austin area. I know this is such an eye chart, and please forgive me for this. Uh, if you'd like to get this in less of an eye chart, uh, you can go to CBRE. Uh, they're the largest commercial brokerage uh, in the country. Uh, they publish the cap rates, and this is specifically the multifamily cap rates, but they publish the cap rates for several different classes of commercial investing. Uh, what I want you to take away here, I put Austin in red. So right now for class A property in Austin, the cap rate is between four and four and a half percent. For class B, the cap rate is between 4.25 and 4.75 percent. Historically in Austin for class A, this number has been in about eight uh, percent. So our cap rate has dropped by about half. What does that mean for us? That means for those of us who are buying commercial multifamily, we're paying a lot more today for those future cash flows coming in than what we paid just 10 years ago when the cap rate was closer to 8%. Uh, Dallas and Fort Worth, who have historically had cap rates that were 1% to 2% higher, so 1% to 2% better than Austin in terms of what you're paying for those future uh, cash flows, are all kind of uh, getting at that, uh, what was probably the new zero, which is about 4%. Um, I know it's such an, don't, oh, really? Do you think that's going to work? I like your optimism. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can't wait to see that. It's going to look like a blob. But uh, again, again, uh, go to cbre.com. Uh, You'll be able to pull this. They publish, yeah, so uh, they publish this uh, every quarter. Uh, this is the, uh, the data for the first half of 2019. Uh, Austin, or excuse me, Houston is about the same cap rate as Austin. Dallas is a little higher, which means you're paying a little less for those future cash flows. Uh, for the Class C, oh, this one, I think this, this one, a camera will work. Yeah, yeah. So for the Class C, uh, for Austin specifically, uh, uh, we're getting those at 45 to 5.25% cap rate, which means we're paying a little less on that purchase price for those future cap rate, for the, pardon me, for those future future cash flows. And a lot of it is because some of those C properties and someone, someone told me the other day, uh, oh, C stands for class crappy. Uh, <laughs> uh, so some of those are not in as great of areas uh, as the class A, class B stuff. Uh, and some of those have a little bit more deferred maintenance or a little more higher maintenance uh, because many of these class C properties, for example, were properties that were built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And some of the construction materials that we used back then are not as uh, maintenance-free, if you will, as some of the construction materials that we use today. Uh, the jobs specifically for Austin, uh, so there's, but it starts out good, it gets not as good, but still good. Uh, so Austin added just under 23,000 new jobs at a growth rate of 2.1% for the 12 months ending June of 2019, uh, making Austin the 15th fastest growing metro, uh, major metro in the United States. Uh, just over 72, there are over 7,200 employers in the high-tech space here in Austin, and 15.8% of all of the jobs in Austin are in the tech industry versus 8.6% of the jobs nationally. And again, that is one of the reasons why our dollar per hour, for example, is higher here in Austin than it is in both Texas as well as in the United States. Um, in 2018, the Austin's high-tech industry grew by 6.6%, uh, which surpassed the Metro's total job growth of 3.6%. So they were pulling up the average while there were other things that were pulling down the average. Uh, Year-to-date, the Austin Metro's labor force grew. So this is just for 2019. This is not the rolling 2019. So I said this is the really good news. This is the good news, but not as good as this. Uh, so year-to-date, we've added 0.8% uh, new jobs, which is below the 36 and 27 that we had during the expansion periods of 2017 and 2018. Uh, further increasing a signaling, uh, further signaling an increasingly tight labor market in Austin. So again, we're still producing jobs, just not at the same rate as we were. 
But again, we still have more, we need people advertisements, right? Then we have people who are looking for jobs. So we're still uh, in a position, is, this is probably actually good that we're not having as many jobs because they're just, they're no, there's no people to fill them, right? So <clears throat> something that's uh, very interesting uh, in this market specifically. <clears throat> I need time for a dramatic water break. I hope that's okay. This is from Austin Title. It shows the historical close rate, the number of uh, units that close in the Austin and surrounding areas uh, for the last five years. So you can see our distribution curve is very heavily weighted towards sales in the summertime. Uh, 2019 is performing well versus 2018. We've had uh, some months that were slight, slightly less, but nothing uh, that's made uh, that's, that has been a big dip for us. In fact, year to date, we are ahead uh, 2019 versus 2018. So this is the year to date chart. It also shows the la the prior month. <laughs> Uh, so last month sales were down, but only 0.6%. Year to date, they're up 2.8%. Uh, average price up 3.7% and 2.2% respectively. Now this is for the Austin and Round Rock area, which is about 80% of the sales that we have here. Um, obviously there are more sales in some of the smaller communities, uh, but these, this represents the 80%. But that's why this average price is so high at 411 7,000 and the median price at 392. Median price also up uh, very consistently uh, for the month of June as well as year to date. The big thing that I, I circled here is something I want you guys to take away is the number of condo sales have been consistently down year over year. So have the number of townhouse sales. Um, but uh, uh, Mark Twain says lies, damn lies, and statistics, okay? So even though this is a big number, right, it's not on a very large number of sales. Uh, so it is a significant drop over where we were last year. Uh, but what I want to focus on is the bigger number in the condo market, which is down 6.5% year over year. And the reason why I say that is because um, um, historically it's been noted that Condos are the canary in the coal mine. The condo market is the first market to go down when the market starts to shift and go down. And condos are the last market segment to go up when the market shifts and goes back up. So for the last six months, we have been seeing a decrease in year-over-year -year condo sales, culminating and getting through June, and we're down about 6.5%. It's not the end of the world. It's not hugely down, uh, but it is down uh, for the first time since roughly the uh, 2011 time frame. So that is a big change, uh, but the sales still are very strong even versus where they were three years ago. And people would say three years ago, they were already uh, very high and, and very, uh, uh, they, were, they were very high at that time. Days on market, uh, right now we're at 46 days for last month, 57 days year to date. That is incredibly fast. Historically, this number has looked closer to about 90 days on market on average. Months of inventory right now at 2.7 months of inventory. Again, the historical average is somewhere between six and six and a half months. So we're running at about half, a little less than half of the inventory that we normally have for this market. Um, pending sales. Uh, is about the same as what it was for the total number of sales last month. So that's a strong indicator that July will be good as well. And we had have just over 8,000 listings right now uh, for Austin and the Round Rock area. And just to give you guys some perspective, uh, back in 2010, for example, we had just under 13,000 listings, but again, we were selling less than 20,000 units. Now we have just over 8,000 listings and we're selling about 35,000 units on that much smaller inventory. And again, that's why uh, that months of inventory number is so incredibly tight. Uh, guys, just really quickly, does anyone have a buzzer that has not yet gone off? Um, okay. 
Uh, I apologize for that. So first off, so but if you have a buzzer that's not gone off, they'll go ahead and process your membership. Uh, I've got Graham and uh, uh, Lucas in the back there, so they'll help you guys get set up with your membership. And if yeah, now yeah, now's good. Yeah, and then if you have not yet joined, but you think, man, I'm getting some value here, and I like how they uh, I like how they run the organization, then I'd love to have you guys as members, uh, and they'll process your membership uh, just right outside the door uh, right now. And they'll be very quick uh, just because they've got several iPads out there to make that process super fast. Uh, months of inventory, however, does vary by price range. So on the lower price houses, months of inventory are much lower. So you can see housing prices that are under 300000 all of these are two months or less of inventory. Housing prices that are, for example, uh, over $400,000, you are seeing three to five months of inventory. And housing prices that are over a million, you are seeing an almost 10-month supply of inventory. So what that means is don't just think, oh, my max holding time is only going to be uh, 2.7 months. No, you have to look at the subject properties, neighborhoods, months of inventory for that asset class, what you're building, and in that price range. Uh, so if you're in that price range, like that's what you gotta, that's what you have to look look at. And for me, when I look at months of inventory, this is how I come up with what my holding costs will be. So I have a certain set of holding costs and what they will be just to get through my renovation. And then I've got expected holding costs based on this months of inventory figure. Months of inventory, and one of the things I've got circled here that I want you to take away is, is about the same as days on market for these houses in this two to $300,000, for the houses in the two to $300,000 category. But houses in the million dollar category, you have almost 10 months of inventory, but they're only on the market for about three months. So a lot of new investors who are only looking at days on market and not looking at months of inventory are going to say, oh, well, I'm only going to hold my property on the market for sale for three months. Well, yeah, that's what happens if rainbows shoot out of your chimney, right? But, but if that does not happen and you're holding it for the max time, right? So one of the things my business coach taught me a very long time ago is, is this. Whenever you're doing an analysis on one of your investments, look at best case, worst case, most likely case, right? Most new investors only look at one case scenario, and that is what? Best case on steroids, right? It's the highest ARV, it's the lowest repairs, and it's the shortest time on market. And as a result, that makes some investors overpay for that property. And when they get to the finish line, they end up spending more, maybe getting less, but definitely holding it longer. The longer you hold a property, the higher your holding cost, which means the lower your profit, right? These things go together. So I want to make sure you guys are aware of that as you're looking at the investments that you're making uh, on the properties that you're investing in. Uh, so guys, the forecasts for the rest of uh, 2019 we have the jobs not as strong as we were adding. We're not, we, we still have as many as we had last year. We're just not adding at the same rate this year in 2019 as what we added in 2018. We have the population growth, whether we want it or not, right? It's coming. Uh, uh, again, uh, growth, but not as strong as it's been in the, in the past. Um, it's kind of a slow flattening, right? So anything really in that 1% range, they call it basically flat year over year. Uh, some of the issues that we will always have here in Austin is affordability. Uh, inventory is incredibly low, which is further increasing that price pressure. And that slowing growth or that flattening of growth or that stabilization of that growth uh, but again, as my pastor always says, the good news that I have to share with you today is that number is positive, right? So you guys can all be thankful for that. And um, again, to finish, uh, we expect a year-over-year -year increase in sales of about 3% and a year-over-year -year increase in price, uh, probably uh, in the 3 to 5% range, all positive, all good, all things to celebrate, but do recognize that we're seeing a 
little bit of a slowdown. And my hope is that in 2020 and 2021, we say, gosh, remember when we had that slowdown in 2019? You mean when we, when we only grew prices by <clears throat> 3 to 5%? You mean when we only grew sales by 1%? Yeah, that was so terrible. No, it was amazing and awesome, right? The opportunity is still uh, very good <clears throat> for the Austin market. And with that, guys, I just want to say thank you so much for being here tonight. I hope you got value, and I hope you use this information in your investing. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you at our next meeting. Thank you, guys.